the van apartment. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, my name is Zach Jones, and I'm with the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. And it's really my uh, privilege to welcome everyone to this 2013 uh, Native American Heritage Month lecture for our lecture series. Uh, of course, I want to acknowledge our sponsors for this, which include the Sea Alaska Corporation and Conoco Phillips. Um, and this leads me next to the opportunity, uh, really, the, the privilege to introduce our speaker. Uh, Alan Boras. Uh, Alan, uh, who has spent 41 years, which is I think an, uh, an incredible contribution um, and service at the Kenai Peninsula College, teaching anthropology. He obtained his PhD uh, from Oregon State University and has largely worked here um, in Alaska, teaching anthropology and working with the local native community. Uh, he has, uh, he, some of you may also know him, he has a column in the Anchorage Daily News where he really works to articulate some of these important aspects to understanding Native life ways and raising awareness of important issues in the state. He's also uh, is working uh, with others uh, and has great concern for the protection of historic sites as well as our, our Alaska environment. Um, and really, I, I could probably go on and give him a, a long introduction, which is just deserved because he's done good work for years, but I want to save time for his presentation. Um, he's here to speak today. Uh, and I, maybe I should mention, of course, he is also the author of uh, Denied a Legacy, the Collected Writings of Peter Kalifornsky. And this, I think, is a, is a great book, which is a bilingual text. Um, which is no uh, no easy task to complete. It was a co-authored volume and just a, a great piece to acknowledge his work uh, as an anthropologist and with the uh, Native community. Um, but to just introduce his topic, he's here to speak about the great blessing of the water, salmon and indigenized orthodoxy on the Michigak River. And with that, uh, please give Alan a, a, hand, of, a hand of applause and welcome. Thank you. Move this down. Yagali Dui Dahti Shishita Shi'izi Alan Boris Katnu Tana Dinainak Shi'izi Tekose. My name is Alan Boris. My Dinaina name is Tekose. Shukaya Kalsilgat. My my village is Kasilaf, Alaska. Shit. Gushtana. My clan is white man. <laughs> but I am an honorary member of the Kanaitsi tribe, and so I respect uh, and give that um, introduction. I'm glad to be here. I want to thank uh, the Sea Alaska Heritage Foundation for inviting me. I want to thank the Tlingit people for inviting me to your land to talk about uh, close to my place, uh, some aspects of uh, spirituality. Uh, I want to just make a, a minor correction. I didn't author that book. Uh, Peter Kalifornsky is the author. Uh, some things in life uh, happen and they, you know at that moment uh, when it happens that a chill goes down your spine and you know it's going to change your life. And Peter uh, came to me. I had known him for 15 years, uh, about uh, three years before he died. And he asked me uh, to help him with his book. He literally said, I want you to be my secretary. And of course, Peter, how can I help? Because Peter effectively was the last to speak the Kenai dialect of the Denaina language. How can I help? What can I do? And so for four years, uh, we worked on that book. Uh, another project that has happened to me, uh, I'll be speaking about today, uh, and that uh, came uh, two years ago when a man from the Environmental Protection Agency came and asked me if I would help 
uh, with the Environmental Protection Agency's assessment of the Bristol Bay region, potentially invoking uh, Clean Water Act 404 restriction on the entire drainage. And uh, I think before I said yes, yeah, uh, uh, right after I said yes, I asked, what is a 404C? And a 404C means a restriction, uh, preemptively restricting any development in an area uh, because of its uh, importance. And, uh, and my job uh, with Catherine Knott was to uh, understand the potential impact on uh, large-scale mining on the indigenous communities of the Nushigak and Quijac drainage. I'll talk, uh, the first part of this, I will talk probably for 20 minutes or so about, um, about the background of that and then lead into the uh, elements of the spirituality of it, focusing on the great blessing of the water. Uh, so we're going to see if the technology works here. I'm going to um, uh, sort of have a theme throughout this, and that is that people raise to the sacred that which is most important in their lives. People raise to the sacred that which is most important in their lives. I've just been in Washington, D.C. on another matter having to do with the Chewit Nicole project. Uh, but on the way back, I took the opportunity to stop and see my, uh, my brother, who I hadn't seen for 10 years, who lives in southern Tennessee. And they took me, he and his wife took me across to northern Alabama, uh, following uh, a path of the Trail of Tears, to a man named Tom Hendricks, who had built a wall for the last 20 years four feet wide, uh, eight, pardon me, eight feet wide, four feet tall, stone by stone, commemorating his grandmother's, great-grandmother's uh, eviction to Oklahoma Territory in the Trail of Tears. The, it has two parts. One part is the part of her going to Oklahoma and then she returned as a young woman. She walked back. Each stone is one step of the way. One step of her uh, walking away and returning home. In part, I think, uh, and he would have to tell you it himself, it's about recognizing that horrific event, that trail of tears but it's also about home. It's about her <clears throat> wanting to live in that place where she grew up, where her culture was. And so it has become a monument. In fact, he said, he found out I was from Alaska, and he said last week there were Tlingit people here. It has become a mecca of indigenous people from Australia, from wherever, coming, leaving a little something, bringing a rock. So someone, I don't, didn't ask, I should have asked from here, brought a rock to put on that wall. I didn't have a rock. If I'd have known I was going there, I'd have brought a rock. But I did have my, my little agate, my lucky agate. The Denina have a lucky agate stone. It's, uh, it symbolizes luck. Luck not as a random event, but luck as a force, like gravity. So I gave him my little agate. <clears throat> that now is a sacred place. People raise to the sacred what is most important in their lives. And that is a sacred place and commemorates that, uh, that aspect. Uh, I believe also that in some cases that sacred place or that concept can go awry. Uh, there is a development now in the United States, really worldwide, called Prosperity Theology. 
prosperity theology is a branch, is a version of an evangelical movement, and not all evangelical movements, but a version of an evangelical movement that essentially says, go to church, tithe, give money, and God will favor you with wealth. Prosperity theology uh, preachers wear Armani suits and drive the most expensive car as a symbol of God's favor on them. I'm, a, I'm supposed to be an unbiased anthropologist, but God doesn't give a shit about your, the, your <laughs> bank account. You'll pardon the expression. God has more to do. God recognizes there are problems in this world that we need to solve and to help with those problems. So people, so we are a materialist world. It is not surprising that we should have raised to the sacred that which is most important in our lives. But this has gone awry. Tom Hendricks has not gone awry. And where I'm going to try to lead us today, the great blessing of the water, the baptism of the water of the Nushigak and the Quijak River to symbolically remove sin, to symbolically remove pollution, is uh, a recognition of a fundamentally important sacred premise. That which is most important in their lives is clean water and salmon. And with ritual, uh, an anthropologist named Roy Rapp Rappaport had said by ritual, its significance is you cannot lie. You are either there or you aren't there. Your presence is there. You cannot lie in ritual. And so we will look at that ritual. Salmon. So the people, the Denina and the Yupik of that area are among the few remaining salmon cultures in the world. They have successfully made the transition from prehistory to now. And salmon and clean water has shaped the cultural values, has shaped the spiritual values in powerful ways. Uh, According to my little research, there are arguably more or less about 25 cultures that I would call salmon cultures. Only the Denina, the uh, Yupik, and the Tlingit are among the few that I would say are remaining salmon cultures. The rest are gone. The people aren't gone, but the salmon are. Here's just a few. The Hoopa, California, the Umatilla of Washington. The salmon has been impacted by dam building, among other things. They're trying to reestablish the salmon now, but the wild salmon are gone. Abnaki, the Micmac of Maine, same thing. The Atlantic salmon are gone. And any Atlantic salmon you get now is farmed salmon. And I've had farmed salmon. It's not the same. It's not the same. It's not wild salmon. Those quaint little Courier and Ives uh, Christmas cards where they show the little mill in New England, well, essentially they traded uh, cotton gins or grain gins from those mills and blocked the salmon streams. The Edelman of Kamchatka, the Ainu of Hokkaido, the Ainu, inheritors of the Jamon culture, 10,000 years of a sustainable culture based, prim based primarily on salmon was wiped out within a few years by um, policies of the Japanese government that uh, on Hokkaido cemented salmon streams, cemented the banks to control for uh, water for rice agriculture, traded rice for salmon. Now the Jamon or the Ainu people have to get a permit from the Japanese government to get one salmon, one, to conduct their traditional first salmon ceremony, which you folks have here as well. And on and on, on it goes. We here on the Pacific have threats 
to our salmon, our wild salmon. Ocean acidification, ocean warming, factory trawler bycatch, spawning habitat destruction, mine caused river de degradation, dam caused river degradation, overfishing, pollution, a little, the Anchorage wastewater facility being uh, one of them. Uh, reduced genetic diversity through hatchery fish and genetically modified salmon. The threat is real. The threat is real. So, people of the Nushigak and Quijak River, six villages, later three more joined, nine villages asked the Environmental Protection Agency to conduct a study, the study that I mentioned, to look at potential invocation of a 404C action uh, because of their concern of industrial mines. Not just the Pebble Mine, you've probably heard of it, the Big Chunk Mine, the Humble Mine, there's about 10 or, 10 or so mines that, that are ready to go, potentially in that area, that could impact the river, could impact the salmon, and uh, could impact the people. That's what they asked, that's what they're afraid of, that's what's in the process of being decided right now. It is government to government consultation. Uh, uh, I had never worked with the Environmental Protection Agency before, uh, but I have to say they, uh, they did seem to take it seriously. They did seem to take it quite seriously that this is a government to government consultation. Uh, although I show the pictures of, of the White House and the Capitol to show, and then there's the Tribal Center in Kaliganuk and there's the Tribal Center in Dillingham to show that it isn't exactly equal government to government consultation, but <laughs> nevertheless, they seem to be trying. And there's EPA's uh, office. There's my briefcase and my cup of coffee, uh, which I always seem to have, just to show you that I was there. And this is the document uh, that is now online that uh, informed, we hope, and informed well the Environmental Protection Agency in making the decision that is going to come within a month or two. It may come before Christmas, it may come after Christmas, but the whole thing is wound down. So you will be hearing about whether, just what action the Environmental Protection Agency takes um, shortly. So a little, just to show you, you've got these beautiful mountains here. This is some of the landscape. That's the New Stoyahook River uh, and the Nushigak River. Uh, that's the Nushigak River at New Stoyahook, uh, the Igiagic, the Quijak River, Pedro Bay, all villages that we went to, all places from southwestern Alaska, all waters. And these are the villages. Uh, we uh, ended up interviewing 53 people in, I think, 11 villages, uh, going to the villages, uh, and uh, here's a little bit about the, the population. Um, population, I want to go to one more here, is stable, uh, it, as opposed to what you may hear in uh, some, uh, some are, um, in fact, I was told in a recent trip to Washington that this was discussed in Senator Begich's office that some are saying that the population is rapidly declining. This is official U.S. Census data. The population is not radically declining. The population is holding steady. This uh, area have been, these er peoples have been salmon cultures for 4,000 years. This is data that we put together for this uh, and we won't go into all the details of it because we have other fish to fry, so to speak, but this is uh, 4,000 years of salmon being the keystone species in the culture, and as a keystone species, it uh, shapes attitudes, it shapes the social organization, and it certainly shapes the spiritual aspects of the people. And there's what some of the sites look like, uh, there's a vi large village by the uh, Quijack River in the upper, in the, in the, uh, uh, where uh, sedentary peoples living in these areas. Uh, the language too reflects salmon. The lang this is Denina. There are 
37 words for salmon and 120 words for fish. You've heard about Inupiaq words for snow. Well, Dena'ina and uh, Yupik words for salmon are just as prevalent uh, and reflect uh, attitudes. And I just put a few of them on here. Vahuntna Gilan, it exists for people. One of the words for salmon. So we went and we talked to people and we asked them, how are salmon and clean water important in your lives? And we had a set of questions we asked, but these were not questions that we wanted yes or no answers to. This was not something you, you asked in a short, uh, short uh, little, uh, little Likert scale, yes, no, scale of one to 10, are salmon important? Yeah, salmon were important. So we wanted people to speak. We wanted to meet with people in their villages, in their home territories. And as in the case in the upper right, uh, to speak in Yupik if people chose to. So we would ask the question, the translator would translate, the person would answer in Yupik, and the uh, translator would give us uh, feedback, and then we later would have it translated more thoroughly. Uh, and so these are, this is some of the setting. Essentially open-ended questions. I'm going to mention a couple here before we get to sacred water. One question was, if you couldn't have wild salmon, what would you do? If you could not have salmon, what would you do? We also asked, how is wealth defined in this community? How do you define wealth? And we'll come to some of the answers. And how do you, uh, do you pray when you catch salmon? And is the water sacred? So all of these were uh, framed, some of the questions that we asked in those types of settings. If you couldn't have wild salmon to eat, what would you do? I'm gonna see if this works here. We got, you know, this is technology. I'm going to let you uh, listen to Mr. Gumlik Puck. That's our main, main food you say we'll start. He didn't say we'd eat beef. He didn't say compensatory mitigation, they could buy us a uh, steak for the rest of our lives and I'd be happy. He didn't say, well, we'd find something else to eat. He didn't say we'd move. He said we'd starve. And he meant that. He could not imagine not having salmon to eat. We'd starve. Elizabeth. Anymore. When asked the same question, we won't be Dena'inas anymore. In her area, they say Dena'ina. I was taught Dena'ina, so I will tend to say that. We won't be Dena'ina anymore. If, you could not have, if we could not have salmon to eat, wild salmon, we would not be Dena'ina anymore. Salmon and identity are intermeshed in close ways that people cannot imagine doing without it. Beef is not an option. We also asked how is wealth defined in this community? And we got one of three answers. Freezer full of, of salmon and wild food, family, or freedom. No one said money. No one's into prosperity theology in the villages. No one said a nice car. No one said a fancy house. That one of three things was answered. A freezer full of salmon, or family, or freedom. I'm all trying to build here the whole idea of raising to the sacred what is most important in your life. So they eat a lot of salmon. When the project first started, the EPA thought we were going to do a project that enumerated 
what is on this graph, that people eat a lot of salmon. Well, yeah, they eat a lot of salmon. That was not, but, but that's sort of, you know, that can be the, the backstory of that, can be compensatory mitigation. So this is how much, uh, the red is salmon. Uh, people do eat a lot of salmon in the villages. The blue is all wild resources, and the little dashed line is the average pounds of meat consumption per capita in the U.S. So uh, this is important. But it's also subsistence. And uh, subsistence as it has emerged in the state has uh, tended to be its own separate thing, but for the people in the villages, uh, subsistence is culture. Subsistence is not broken down into this is what we eat and this is what we, these are other things we do. Subsistence and culture are the same thing. So a couple of uh, quotes from young people. And we, I didn't do these, by the way. We didn't do these for, um, for uh, you didn't know we were going to be in this beautiful boardroom and, you know, we're out you know, doing this. So the sound quality is, might not be as great. But here's Dolores. We're going to meet Dolores again. Dolores is a young person, and she's talking about subsistence. You know, growing up, we were raised with <clears throat> salmon, you know, and also other, like the moose meat and everything. I used, I used to get so tired of it when I was young. Like, because we'd have it every single day sometimes. Uh -huh. But I didn't realize until I started living on my own how important uh -huh. the, um, gathering our salmon and uh -huh. other wild foods is until uh -huh. I started living on my own because we depend on it so much. So like all young people, you know, she questioned, uh, can't we have you no know, tacos? Can't we have pizza? And nothing wrong with tacos or pizza. But as uh, very young, she realized how important this is and this lifestyle is. And as I say, we'll return to her. This is her, uh, this is her cousin, I believe. You guys have sensitive mice here. I feel, you know, I feel rich with my, my freezers full up. Whenever yeah. my freeze full up, I, mm -hmm. I feel rich. Mm -hmm. Full freezer. So that's wealth. That's wealth in the village. And everywhere I stayed, you know, you'd see two, three freezers full of wild food. And uh, that's, not, uh, that's not an easy task. That's not just going out and doing a little rod and reel fishing. That's not an easy task. Wealth is uh, putting away fish for the winter. I would submit to you that the diets of the villages in that area may be like your diet, I don't know, is among the best in the world. In the world. Salmon. Love the dog, by the way. Dog's chilling out there, putting up salmon. There's the smokehouse. There's the potato patch in Kaliganuk. You know, put a few potatoes in the ground, they grow great. There's a greenhouse in New Stuyahook, new modern greenhouse, providing uh, food security. That's the new word, right? Food security. Everything on that uh, is uh, homegrown, home caught, wild food, uh, one of the best diets in the world. And you have to throw a little agoutic in there as well, which is. Uh, um, that probably doesn't do great things for the arteries, but when you work really hard, it's going to be fine. Uh, as we know, tragically, uh, on some parts of Alaska, king salmon in particular are on decline. And uh, in parts in the Yukon Kuskokwim area, the diet is now deemed 63% poor diet, or 37% needing improvement. That's as of 2006, and it's probably worse now. The Nushigak and the Quijak, but particularly the Nushigak, the King or, or uh, Chinook Salmon Run is not imperiled. It's a strong run. Um, 
and, uh, and there is increasing evidence that the Yupik in that area have resistance to coronary disease, diabetes, stroke, and it's very possible there is a genetic adaptation to salmon that protects people from these types of diseases. The basic data has to do with a body mass index, whatever that, and they should have diabetes, but they don't. They should be having strokes, but they don't. They should be having problems, they don't have the problems. And the research is directed at the benefits of omega-3 fatty acids. And remember, this, remember the, how, how much salmon, they're eating a lot of salmon. This is also an interesting um, finding uh, that we got a hint of when we talked to people and put it this way, uh, that uh, what we might call mental health, the measurement of mental health, is more effectively done by seeing how much fish is put up and the size of the woodpile. Essentially walking the village, is the freezer full? If the freezer's not full, there's a problem. Is the wood pile full? Good. If it's not, there's a problem. A better indicator than any paper test that anybody else, anyone else could do. Treatment for what we might call mental health has been found by some to be eating a traditional diet, best diet in the world, traditional singing and drumming as treatment, steam baths, there's, there's the steam bath in, uh, that's in uh, Nustuyahuk. So I got invited, I have to tell a little steam bath story. They do competitive steam baths here. Do you guys do competitive steam baths? You got, you, you must, you know. <laughs> so this is usually guys in their 30s. And uh, so, and you know, I'm a sitting duck, you know. They knew, oh, a guy from, guy from outside the village. So, um, so the steam baths are very elaborate. There's three sections. And uh, the, in, the, in the hot of the hots uh, was, uh, and I looked at the thermometer, 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So, then they try to outdo one another. <coughs> You know, and they're pouring the water on and, you know, I said, 300 degrees? White guys cook at 300 degrees, you know? But they thought that was pretty funny. But the steam bath is also, we could, we could go into that as a spiritual place. It's a community place. Men go in separately from women, a lot of talking, a lot of joking, a lot of gossip, but a lot of working out the issues of the day. Old men, young children, three, four years old, all in the same place, working through it as a community. Every night, every night, steam bath is going. Chopping wood. I can relate to that. I actually got, I've been gone a week. I got to get back and get, get to my wood pile. Chopping wood, the therapy of chopping wood, the rhythm of it. The movement to transform the, the log into the pile. Therapy and measured the size of the wood pile. Tundra walking. And last, subsistence fishing and hunting. <coughs> Therapy. This is what we do. This is what you do if you're Yupik or Denina in that area. And probably do here too in, the, in, the, in this area. Hard one to talk about, but uh, read the papers, we know that uh, suicide is of epidemic proportion in parts of rural Alaska. Parts of rural Alaska. We tend with our modern media to think that anything that happens in one place in rural Alaska happens everywhere. Not so. Tragic. There's the Bethel census area the Northwest Arctic census area. Through time, the suicides triple the Alaska rate, and Alaska rate's high enough. 
But there is the Dillingham census area and the Lake and Peninsula census area. The little dashes mean it's too low to measure. Too low to measure at the whatever statistical significance level. Not that there are no suicides, but almost none. Why? I think because of strong subsistence and strong social values and strong spiritual values related to it. It's measured in this chart. And this, in a way, is what the people are afraid of. If salmon and clean water were to be impacted. And that's, of course, still an if. But it's what people are worried about. Subsistence requires cash. But not a full-time job. I'm going to go on to the next slide and show how subsistence is full-time work. But there I'm standing on the bank of the Nushigak in the upper left uh, with uh, there's the subsistence skiffs ready to go. This is May. The kings are about to come in and they're ready to go. They're ready to go down, take the four-wheeler down, take all the stuff, out you go. And I turn around and there are the commercial salmon boats that are going to be put in the water for July for commercial fishing in Bristol Bay. Giving enough cash to pay for the boat, to pay for the Yamaha four-stroke, to pay for the gun, to pay the electric bill, but not take away from subsistence activity because a full-time job, eight to four, or two weeks on, two weeks off, as the case may be, or whatever it might be, takes you out of the subsistence loop. So the trick is enough cash to pay for the tools of subsistence and related things, but not so much that you can't do subsistence because subsistence is a full-time job. Family. Multi-generational meaningful work at fish camp. Where do we have that these days? Where do we have multi-generational meaningful work? I know there's pockets here and there, but it doesn't happen in a lot of places. Dad goes to work, mom goes to work, kid goes to school, back again for a little bit maybe, but multi-generational meaningful work. So there in the upper left is grandma, cutting fish. There's her daughter. There's the grandchildren. Multi-generational meaningful work. And in the course of that, the values of the culture, the values of the place, the attitudes toward the land, the attitudes toward the fish, language retention in the case of Yupik, language revitalization in the case of Denina, or Denaina as would be said here. Sharing. Sharing. So sharing has, in that part of the world, and maybe in this too, uh, really a, a, a specific thing. It's not just have some fish. It's defining who's a member of the community. And it's couched in an expression of love. So the Denina concept of sharing food and sharing love have the same grammatical constructions. I could show you that, uh, but that would take another two hours and I'd have to stumble through it. It's complicated, but the root word, the root verb means the same thing, to share. I think I'm going to play another little clip here. Be a very rich person if you share. Yeah. If you don't share, you're nobody. You don't share, you're nobody. And what she meant, not nobody like you're worthless as a person, but you're not part of the community. You're not part of the group. If you don't share, you're not part of us. Subsistence is not welfare. That's a dominant theme in Alaska today, that, well, they can't go to Walmart, they can't go to Fred Meyer, they can't go to wherever, so they must have to do subsistence. But if they could, they would much rather go to Walmart. Poor people. 
fell off the turnip, turnip truck. It's not so. Subsistence is a preferred lifestyle. We met Dolores before, and there's her husband, Andrew. We had supper in, her, in their house. Andrew had just come back from a moose hunt. We had moose stew. Uh, they prefer that lifestyle. That's what they want to do. They could move to Anchorage. They could move to Juneau. They could move. They want to live in Kaliganek. They want to raise their daughter there. We were having, uh, we were having, getting ready for supper, and the little girl, I don't know, three maybe, climbs up in my lap. She's looking at me, and I'm, you know, I'm the only white guy in the village, you know, so, and I'm really white, as you can tell. <laughs> She's looking at me, and finally she says, wow, you have a lot of hair in your ears. <laughs> very confident, very confident young woman. Dolores and Andrew want that daughter to be raised in the village. Dogs running around, happy dogs, I gotta say. Happy dogs, kids on bikes. Hey, what you doing here? Happy place, I saw, anyway. I'm not want to paint a, you know, uh, that there's no problems, there are problems. It's life, but a very functional places. Freedom, freedom. It was Andrew when I asked, or we asked, why do you live in this village Andrew answered with one word. Now, Andrew is not one to use two words if one word will do. Andrew is, uh, are you from the newspaper? He's Andrew, from the radio. You're from the radio, okay. Well, Andrew's a tough interview. Andrew's a one word kind of guy. <laughs> Why do you live in this village? And Andrew answered, freedom. Freedom. That was his answer. And what he meant by that, so here's standing on the, on the bank of the Nushigak, and it's 200 miles to the next village. What I believe he meant by that was freedom to live his cultural traditions, having the uh, strictures of those cultural traditions, not the freedom to do anything you want. We were in Nustoyuhuk in May, and two young guys, we were at uh, Margie's house, and two young guys, and one was 18, I think the other was 20, something like that. Young guys were getting ready to, to go on a goose hunt. The geese were coming in. And, and so Margie's son and Margie's uh, nephew. And Margie says, where are you going? And said, so, oh, we're going up the Mulchatna. Now, the Mulchatna from that area is about 150 miles by river, and there's nothing else there. There's no other villages, nothing. How long are you going to be gone? Uh, they had an exact day, 17 days. She says, okay, be careful. And off they went. This is my son, Eric. It'd be like when Eric was, was uh, that age and he's going to Anchorage. How long gonna be gone? Oh, a week. Okay, be careful. I, Eric's been in a lot of places. But in this, and this is an area where you cannot make a mistake. You can't be stupid. You can't be, oh, we're out in the wilderness, yeah. You've got to follow, you've got to follow the traditions that you learned from your aunts, from your uncles, from your father, from your elders. You've got to follow those. When I went back to the great blessing of the water, we are gonna get to that. I saw them. Oh yeah, you were going up the, up the Mulchatna. How was that? And they said, fine. Again, not, not one to use a lot of words. Fine, just good. Freedom. I believe what they were expressing was inherent in the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I just pulled out a few. Article seven, number two, indigenous peoples have the collective right to live in freedom, peace and security as distinct people. Article 20, number one, indigenous peoples have the right to be secure in the enjoyment of their own means of subsistence and development and to engage freely in all their traditional and other economic activities. Freedom. That's what Andrew was expressing. That's what people are worried about that they might not be able to do.
Okay. All of this informs a spiritual attitude toward the land, the foods, and the activity. Do you pray when you catch salmon? Uh, and I'm not going to play this one. It's kind of a long clip. I want to save one for later. But inevitably, people looked at us and said, of course. It's like, like it was a silly question. And in their minds, it was a silly question. Because everybody prays when they get the first salmon. There is still a first salmon ceremony that is practiced where the first salmon that is caught is shared, particularly to the elders. And the first salmon that is caught is shared to the underground. There's the cemetery. A little bit of salmon will be put under the sod, under the duff, under the sod for the elders. Now, I'm, you know, I'm only an anthropologist, but there's some symbolism there, right? Salmon, people, heritage, ancestors, life. First salmon ceremony, a renewal ceremony. The salmon come back. Life is good again. We will, we will maintain ourselves as a people. Here's uh, uh, from Nandalton. People are talking about uh, Mother Earth providing for us. And uh, people talking about uh, being glad on the other side. The other side is the salmon being shared, the salmon being returned to the water, the salmon becoming salmon again, and coming back. The other side is where the salmon go to become salmon again. Nancy and Rick uh, talking uh, passionately about how important the spiritual attitudes they have are. And sacred water, Malishak in Yupik, Bageshk ul Mishni, water without evil essence in Denaina. I believe very ancient concepts, uh, concepts that have to do with um, water as being that essence of life. And certainly, probably all cultures have this. Uh, and uh, and in very ancient ideas. I attended church a lot when I was there, uh, more than I probably attended in the last 40 years, to try to understand, to try to understand what was going on. And um, I uh, have used the term indigenized orthodoxy. I'm not sure that's the best term, but it seemed to, seemed to help me make sense of what was going on uh, orthodoxy coming from Russia, but coming across the northern taiga, the northern tundra. Um, and many of the very ancient concepts being incorporated into orthodoxy as an expression of what was meaningful to the people. A ready access, if you will, of that which is sacred, uh, that which is most important being raised to the sacred. Part of it is indigenized priests, indigenous priests. Father Akelsak, um, uh, uh, Father Deacon uh, Nikolai in New Stoyahuk. Uh, and so through the priests, the, many of these um, traditional concepts receive their expression in orthodoxy. And they're at all meetings. So, ritual. How are we doing for time? Oh, really? Okay, I gotta go fast. I'm sorry. Can you be late? Can you be late for work? Sorry, I get carried away. So I'm gonna, this is gonna take about a minute. So this is the eve of, uh, of Theophany. So this is the great blessing of the water, a time, a theophany, and uh, is when God reveals himself to, hu himself to humans. And theophany recognizes the blessing uh, of the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. So this is Nustoyahuk, and so I, we kept hearing about this, and uh, so I went out 
because I wanted to see for myself how it worked. And I was invited, I, I contacted Father Alexa and he said, well, you could go here, here, and here. And I chose this uh, place. Uh, I bet we'd been there before. Uh, I just want to say this is winter and it's about uh, 10 degrees. And can you see the flag there? The flag is straight out, so it's cold. So I did not really intend this, but I'm going to play a little bit of this ceremony the night before. The whole village is in the church. The whole village. Oh, well, there might be a few, but uh, it's packed. And, uh, and the next morning, another service is held, and the people then go out onto the ice where a baptism ceremony is held. So, as one explained it to me, so it recognizes John the Baptist's baptism of Jesus, but with ascension, Jesus is God. And the purpose of baptism is to remove sin, remove, uh, but Jesus is now God, no sin to remove. So the ceremony is transferred to one of God's most important creations, the water. The water. So the water is literally baptized in this ceremony. A cross is cut into the ice, and the Father is conducting that ceremony. At the moment the cross is di dipped into the water for the third time, the water is now sanctified. The water is now pure. The water is now holy. For uh, two reasons, and I'm, in the interest of time I won't play this, but he will say they bless the water because they want the fish to come back to clean water. People raised to the sacred what is most important in their lives. And the fish coming back, most important, tra transferring that ceremony to the water. The water then becomes a uh, uh, sacred, but also is medicinal. So that's the second use. So water is gathered. And this is a steady stream of people going out that day in their snow machines and four-wheelers gathering buckets of water for use for medicinal reasons. I got some too. There's mine. I got two jugs. Gave one to a man who was battling cancer still alive and I'm still here too so medicinal so I want to talk about Tatiana and 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 she will talk about when she was a girl she will say before I was a lady and she will talk about almost going to the big church almost dying and she asks for water for holy water and she will call it Malashak Malashak This will take about a minute.
I will, I will be honest with you people. Yeah. I wouldn't be talking to you right now. Long, long time ago, I was married to a become a lady. Yeah. We were up with us, my mom and dad. My mom was sick too. My grandpa was a dad too, and Uncle Elaine as well. Mm -hmm. During that time, I, I guess I almost go, you know. But my daddy prayed for me. If somebody really true, praying really hard, yeah. I guess he'll answer you. My dad tell me, I have no, no more breathing, no more pulse. Mm -hmm. When I come through, my dad was holding me like this, mm -hmm. up, you know, feeling my heartbeat. As soon as I opened my eyes, my dad said, you, you get up? I said, yeah. I told him I was going to sleep. I come, he woke me up. I was going to go to big church. And my dad said, you can't go big church. And he told me that. I told him, holy water, I call him lady for you. Marisa. Marisa, holy water. Okay. Marisa, give me holy water to drink. He did, my daddy did. Yeah. Give me a little bit, you know. I could feel it. I, I opened my eyes. I swallowed. The water was going down to my stomach. And no more I could my eyes. Pretty soon I come through. My daddy was up. Mama was sleeping. She was sick too. Up, up, we was up. I go, but I came back. I was going to that big church. I, my daddy told me not to go into the church. Come back before I become a lady. It's really true that I tell you guys too. Mm -hmm. Better not forget that. Okay. Holy water is strong. That would make me come back. Mm. And she pounded the table. Uh, holy water is strong. Don't forget that. So, last slide. Why should we care? A couple thousand people uh, in the face of. Uh, of a value of uh, mining activity that could measure in the quarter to half a trillion dollars. Why should we care? A lot of reasons I would submit to you one of them is that it's not about us saving them, it's about them saving us. Us, I mean Koshitana. Providing the blueprint for how to live in this world or how to live locally, how to live with healthy diets, how to live socially connected, how to live with the value system, and how to recognize uh, what is most important in our lives and to raise it to the sacred. So thank you. I'm sorry if I made any of you late for work, but thanks for inviting me. Thanks for, thanks for attending.